out there on the NRC has to be real well talked about there. But, and uh, just just discussing also the endophyte issues that, that mm -hmm. uh, Chris was talking about as far as side effects on the animals and things like that. So it's a pretty good section of lesson. So, you know, I will say one thing about the, about the symptoms of tall fescue toxicosis. A lot of times we, we focus on the, on the very acute symptoms like sloughed hooves and tail switches that fall off and ears that fall off and so forth. But, but really what's impacting the bottom line is lower conception rates and lower average daily gain. So those are things that are hard to see and, and measure. They're not as, as, as uh, visible. And, but they make a tremendous impact. They estimate a, a billion dollars a year to the beef cattle industry for lower animal performance and conception rates. So I mean, it's a real, real problem. But the big issue is we've never had a metric to, to measure it against. You know, we've had these cows on toxic tall fescue our entire lives, and they've always done poorly in the summertime, and, and that's just the way they do. You know, it's not until you put them beside calves on a novel endophyte tall fescue that you see there is really a big difference. All right, let's move on. I'm, Roger asked me to talk a little bit about the sorghum species. And I, I did, when I was in Virginia, I did quite a bit of work with the sorghum species. And, and kind of the question we want to answer, I'm going to show you some data and talk about selecting varieties, but, but kind of where do they fit into grazing systems? And I'll give you my, my 30 second message on annuals. I, I think well managed grazing systems are going to be based on well adapted perennial forage species. And, and um, that are supplemented with annuals, both cool and warm season. I don't think in this part of the country we want to have a system based on annual forages. We want to have a, a perennial based system with annual forages that supplement during times of the year when those perennial forages are less or not productive. And that's kind of where these summer species fit into the summer months. They also can be used as a vehicle to transition um, between perennial forage crops. So if you have a thinning pasture and you want to renovate that pasture, an annual forage sequence can be very good for making that transition from one perennial to another. So this is kind of what we see in this, this transition area uh, of the United States. We've got a, a hump of growth with our cool season forage species in the spring, secondary hump in the fall, we call that bimodal forage distribution. And then during the summertime, when temperatures get warm, Growth is limited in cool season grasses by high temperature. When we get above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, we tend to really reduce the, the productivity of cool season grasses. In contrast, a warm season grass, which would kind of fit right into the middle in the summer months, it doesn't reach peak photosynthesis until about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So it has the ability to respond to, to water during the summer months um, more than a cool season grass because it has that ability to grow at a higher temperature. Um, in general, a, a warm season grass will produce about twice as much dry matter during the summer months per unit of water use compared to a cool season grass. And, and that's important for people that are irrigating forages. If you're irrigating forages, say for a grazing dairy, then you definitely want to be growing some summer annuals or su summer type grasses. Um, because they're more efficient at using that irrigation water, but also important for rain-fed systems because summer annual grasses will have the, the ability to respond to smaller amounts of rainfall during the summer and produce more dry matter for grazing. So in, in the past, we, we've had this kind of this recommendation for choosing summer annual varieties. Find a reasonably priced variety that's locally available and focus on management. And there's no question that management with these summer annual varieties is important, but, but some of the breeding advances is really kind of question, put into question this, this idea that you just go to a co-op and get whatever they have. We've made some real breeding advances in terms of uh, both productivity and digestibility in summer annual grasses, especially the sorghum species over the last decade or so. And it, it's important that we take advantage of those um, those advances in terms of better forage genetics. And I'm going to show you a little bit of this data. So when I was in Virginia, we, we tested forages. I started in 2000, and we started to test them in the early 2000s, um, summer annual varieties. And we, we uh, continued to test them all the way through when I left in 2016. 
Um, when we started, we only really looked at, at yield of these summer annuals. And in 2009, we started to look at not only yield, but also digestibility of these summer annual forages. And we evaluated um, in our summer annual trials Sudan grass and sorghum Sudan grass and forage sorghum and um, pearl millet primarily and, and then a couple other oddballs. Um, but those were our primary types of species that we were evaluating. In the pretty standard management, we put on 75 pounds of nitrogen at seeding. And then when we clip those, and we clip them somewhere between three and five times a year, depending on the year, we would um, apply 75 pounds of nitrogen and then 60 pounds after each cutting, uh, except for the last cutting, of course. This was the first year that we, we started to test the uh, digestibility. This stands for Summer Annual Variety Trial 2009. In, in that year, we had more than these um, two, four, six varieties. We had 20-some varieties in that particular trial. Um, but, but I don't want to show you all that data because it, it gets so small you can't see anything. So I chose two of the top performing, two of the bottom performing, and two that were kind of in the middle. And um, in, these are the species. We had a forage sorghum, sorghum Sudan grass, Sudan grass, pearl millet. Um, Sudan grass and Sudan grass, and they were under um, a clipping type management. So we clipped them, I can't remember, it was four times, I think, in 2009. Some of them had what we called the BMR trait, that stands for the brown midrib trait. If, if you've never seen that, it's, it's uh, actually a tannish or a brown midrib in the, uh, on the leaf of the um, sorghum species. We find this trait in forage sorghum, Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grass hybrids. And, um, and now, sometimes in pearl millets, we have some newer pearl millet varieties that have the BMR trade in it. And, and that's a phenotypic or an outward expression of something that's different within that plant. And what's different in that plant is the, the lignin levels. Generally, when a, a plant has this BMR trait, they have lower levels of lignin in that plant. Lignin is a compound that makes the plant fiber less digestible. So uh, generally speaking, brown midrib varieties tend to be more digestible than non-brown midrib varieties. And there is some variation in that, but, but as a general note, they tend to be more digestible. And that translates into higher animal performance. I was just on a, a committee for a graduate student from uh, University of Georgia, and she was comparing a BMR and a non-BMR variety, and she gained about a third of a pound of average daily gain by selecting a BMR variety for grazing. All right, so we got this data back from the lab. This was the first harvest in 2009, and the yield, the yield difference was pretty amazing. It ranged at the first harvest from 38 to 6,800 pounds of dry matter, so a big range in yield at that first harvest. And then we got the lab data back, and when I got it back, there was a big range in, in the digestibility, and this stands for in vitro true digestibility. So we take that plant material and we put it in rumen fluid from the animal, and we have cows that have big rubber plugs in their side, and you pull the plug out and get rumen fluid out, and you put that ground forage material in it, and you measure what the microbes digest of that material, and that's what we call in vitro true digestibility. And um, so we had a big range, 54 to 74 percent, and when I got those numbers back from the lab, I said, well, Certainly, those varieties that yielded so much are going to be the lowest in digestibility, right? Because they were more mature, there's more biomass there. So we started to match those numbers up, and lo and behold, some of the highest yielding varieties were also some of the most digestible in this trial. And that kind of piqued my interest in, in this relationship between yield and digestibility. And so we started to look at that over the years. And this was the relationship between yield and digestibility in 2009. So this is in vitro true digestibility on this axis, and this is yield down here. What you can see from this graph is there is, in 2009, there is no relationship between yield and digestibility. It's like a shotgun pattern on there. And so we went through the years, and we looked at this relationship over the years. Some years we had a, a slight negative trend as, as digestibility inc decreased decreased um, yield increased. But, but about half or more of the years that we looked at this, we had no relationship or a weak relationship. So kind of a quick summary, um, in, in, I've got a long presentation on this, but, 
Today we're just going to be telling you a, a little, giving you the highlights of this work. The relationship varied from year to year. We had um, no relationship in, in 2009, 10, and 15. And the, see a typo there. 2011, 12, and 14, we had a, a negative relationship or a weak negative relationship. We don't understand all the factors that impact this relationship. Um, but what we do know is that we need to look for outliers. And what I mean by that is we need to look for those varieties that have increased levels of digestibility and good yield. And, and that's kind of the, one of the things that we want to pick out of this data. Um, and I'm going to show you how we do that in a minute. This is, a real, this is the impact of the BMR trade on in vitro digestibility. What we saw over the years was a very consistent impact on digestibility. So varieties in the trial that had the BMR trait, and this is averaged over all the varieties, the black bar that had the BMR trait, and the gray bars varieties that did not have the BMR trait in the trials. Averaged over those uh, varieties in the trial, we had a very consistent response to that BMR trait. We had increased digestibility of those varieties. So if you went to the store and chose a bag of forage sorghum or um, sorghum Sudan grass or Sudan grass that had the BMR trait, you're generally going to increase digestibility by about 5%. Some varieties had, a, um, had, had you know, up to 10% increase in digestibility depending on the individual variety in the trial. So anyways, we, we've taken all this data from all this yield in digestibility data and we put it in spreadsheets like this. And, and we give people these spreadsheets and say, here you go. And, and there's literally, over the years, you know, we've got 10,000 or more data points in there. And people look at that and they say, huh, that's nice. And then that's the last time they ever look at it. It's just overwhelming the amount of data in there. So one of our, our goals was to take this information and kind of put it in a form that people could actually use. And we came up and, and visualize which varieties they want to try in the system. So we came up with this graph and what we did was we indexed the yield here on the bottom axis and on this axis here, the y-axis, the in vitro digestibility. We indexed it against the average for the trial. So a zero on this graph would be the average yield for the trial. And then we could rank varieties as either being above average in yield or below average in yield. We did the same thing for in vitro true digestibility. Average digestibility in the trial would be zero, so we could rank varieties above average or below average in yield. And then we could uh, divide this up into four quadrants here with these two lines. So if we look at the lower left-hand quadrant here, we, we've got varieties that have below average yield and below average digestibility. Those are summer annual varieties that you probably don't want to include in a forage program. But if you go to the upper right-hand quadrant, these varieties have above average yield and above average digestibility. Those are ones that you might want to consider putting into a forage program. So we went through the years, and each year that a variety appeared in that upper right-hand quadrant, we have kind of marked it in the spreadsheet. And, and what we want to start to look for is those varieties that have consistent performance across years. And so we start to see these varieties that have two or three or even four in some cases now, X's where they've performed above average in both yield and digestibility for multiple years. Those are varieties that you really want to think about putting into a forage program. And, uh, and there's a couple of those varieties on here. So ask your seed guys out there about those varieties if, if that's something that interests you. So the take-home message from all this data is that, that when we think about selecting summer annual varieties for grazing systems, we want to be looking at more than just yield. We want to be looking at digestibility. And, and it's you guys have to ask your seed guys about that. Um, not all seed companies like to do digestibility trials because they're kind of expensive to do. But, but really, you need that data to select varieties that are both high in yield and high in digestibility so that you can enhance animal performance. So kind of where do these summer annuals fit into grazing systems uh, in, in states like Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois? And, and one system may be a weaning system for fall-born calves. When I was in Virginia, we did um, a considerable amount of work where we took calves from smaller farms and kind of put them together and backgrounded them and got them ready to go. Um, 
away as the tractor trailer lot size. And, and that was kind of an expensive program. It cost us about $2.25 a day uh, to have a calf in that program. And they gained about 2.5 pounds a day was the target. Sometimes they gained that much, sometimes they didn't, depending on weather conditions. And that was on a hay ration plus a, uh, a pelleted supplement. Summer annuals might provide a more cost-effective backgrounding system um, versus the, the hay plus a grain ration. And generally speaking, we can probably graze summer annuals for about 90 cents a day, somewhere between 90 and a dollar a day versus $2.25. So there's some real opportunities there to put weight on calves relatively inexpensively using these summer annuals. And I've got a whole spreadsheet on that. If you're interested in seeing that, I'll, I'll share that with you. We have it on our Google Drive. And it's kind of an interactive spreadsheet that looks at a summer uh, annual weaning system for fall-born calves. Um, the other place that, that summer annuals can fit into um, Grazing systems is a means to renovate pastures. So as we go through a winter like we've gone through this year, you, you have a lot of pastures that are probably torn up from, from uh, being so wet and, and pugging uh, uh, the animal hooves. So, so those pastures that need renovated may be a great place to use summer annuals. You come in here this spring, use a summer annual, and then come back into a perennial this fall. And we can even go a step further and start with the winter annual for pastures that need renovated go into a summer annual and come back and do a fall seeding of a perennial uh, improved forage species. All right, I want to talk just a little bit about drought in, in corn and sorghum. We don't have drought here, do we? we I, had a, um, I had a friend in Red House, Virginia, and uh, he said that Red House, Virginia is the dry, driest place in Virginia. He said that during Noah's great flood, they got two inches. So, and there are spots like that that tend to be a little bit drier. And, uh, and so I want to talk just a little bit about drought and uh, corn and, and how forage sorghum may fit into that system. So we did a, we did a study a few years ago and, and we went in and we planted corn and forage sorghum either alone or together in a mixture. So we had a standard rate of corn and um, seeding rate of corn, and then we added two, four, six, or eight pounds of forage sorghum to it, or we just planted uh, eight pounds of forage sorghum alone. And we used a, a rachitic dwarf BMR uh, sorghum, it was AF7401, it's from Alta Seeds. Kind of a neat product if you've never seen it. I don't know, is there anybody that handles that here? We got, yeah, um, in the back there. It's kind of a neat product, so one of the problems what I call the Achilles heel of forage sorghums would be they would get so tall and produce so much biomass that they would tend to lodge sometimes. And that was a real problem because if you've ever seen, you know, 50 acres of lodged forage sorghum, I mean, it can be a real mess in, in trying to chop that. And um, so this rachitic dwarf is kind of interesting because they've shortened the inner nodes between the leaves. So it doesn't have fewer leaves, but it's got the leaves a lot closer together. And it probably gets, I don't know, about five to six feet tall usually and uh, produces a, a decent uh, grain head on it too. So and I've never seen it lodge in uh, testing it for about 10 years now. So it's a pretty, pretty neat product. Anyways, we use that variety, 100 pounds of nitrogen at seeding, and then uh, we harvest it at the soft dough stage for the forage sorghum. We planted this late, and, and we did that to simulate a, a late planting of silage corn. Um, Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not when we plant corn late. But we did that to simulate a, a late, so we planted in May, um, around May 15th, I think, for this trial. And this is how it looked in the summer of 2010. So we, we got pretty, pretty dry with some temporary drought stress. And what was interesting is that this, these leaves that are curled up here, that's corn. So it's curling up, showing drought stress. <laughs> These leaves that are open and wide and just hanging out is the forage sorghum. Pretty amazing difference in the drought tolerance. And, and of course, you know, the, the guys from the seed company show up, and I feel bad about showing them the plots because they look so miserable. It's 95 degrees out. They don't have any water. And, and the guys from the company say, no, this is exactly what we want to see. We want to see how it does under this kind of stress. And so when we looked at this, 
the yields, and this is adjusted to 35% dry matter, the silage yields. This is corn alone. We had about 10,000 pounds of, of adjusted silage yield there. Versus with as little as four pounds of forage sorghum, we had about 20, 23,000 pounds of dry matter in 2010. So adding just a little bit of sorghum to that mix really increased the ability of that corn to that silage crop to produce even under significant drought conditions. Did the same study in 2011, same, same response. The late planted corn just did not do well. When we added as little as uh, um, four pounds of forage sorghum, you know we were up around 30,000 pounds of um, adjusted silage yield. Now, having said that, you know, 30,000 pounds, 15 tons of silage, so we're not tearing it up, but, but we're not on the best soils. We're not on soils like we have in Illinois or western Kentucky. These were pretty marginal soils in the south side of Virginia. So the potential of forage sorghum is probably higher here, but, but the potential corn is probably higher too. So, um, so if you can grow a good corn silage crop pretty consistently, you know, it still may be a good choice for you. Uh, just show you a little bit of data from some um, si silage trials. These are just uh, the adjusted yield of some different varieties that we had in initially. This is 7401, the Burkitic Dwarf had um, a good yield. And this is an older variety from southern states, SS15. It's a dwarf non-brown non midrib, had uh, good yields. Um, one of the things that we did with these varieties is we took them apart and looked at yield components of that plant. And, and with these burkitic dwarfs, what we found was that the leaf made up a significantly larger portion of the dry matter of that plant. What's that? Why is that important? Well, generally speaking, the leaves are the most digestible part of the plant. So when we have plants that have higher ratios of stock, like these two taller growing varieties, they tend to have more, less digestible biomass. So we did a study. Um, Uh, that looked at seeding rate and nitrogen rate. And I just wanted to show you, and that, that in the middle is our corn control plot. You can see how shriveled up it is and, and how nice this uh, rachitic dwarf forward sorghum is in uh, August. And what I wanted to show you here was not only the response to seeding rate, so this goes from uh, 25,000 seeds up to 175,000 seeds per acre. But really, when we got up to the 60 to 90,000 seed range, we, we really didn't see any increase in yield. So we don't have to use a lot of forage sorghum seed per acre. But what was the most interesting part of this was, um, was comparing this silage yield with the average uh, yield for a, a corn silage variety trial held at the same location. So they were in two different fields right beside each other. What happened to that corn silage crop is that it was probably almost as tall as this room, but it got really hot and dry during pollination. So essentially, we had a plant that had no ear on it. And in that year, the average yield was just over six tons uh, per acre for the corn silage plots versus um, up to 16 tons for the uh, sorghum plots. So the big benefit of forage sorghum is going to be the increased drought tolerance that it possesses compared to corn. So this is uh, data from a paper. It was a summary paper published in Forage and Grazing Lands where they looked at um, dairy cow performance or milk production on uh, BMR sorghum versus a uh, corn silage. And, and what they found was is that the, the sorghum that had the BMR trait had as good or, or better production than corn in most years. One of the, the Achilles heel of forage sorghum is uh, with the conventional varieties, they've never, cows have never quite milked as well off of the conventional varieties as they have uh, corn silage. And that's one of the reasons that dairymen don't like to use them. But these, these BMRs are really going to be a game changer, I think, in terms of milk production on these farms. So kind of where does forage sorghum fit into production systems? I don't, I don't think it's going to replace corn. I don't think it should replace corn in most cases. Um, maybe as mixtures and insurance, um, but its best fit is probably on mar soils that are marginal for corn silage production. So if you've got some soils that are droughty or uh, shallow, sorghum may be a better fit than corn on those soils. Um, arid regions or, or regions that are prone to short-term drought stress, 
So Red House, Virginia, where, where they only got two inches of rain during uh, Noah's great flood, um, may be a good place for forward sorghum. And then delayed or late silage plantings may be a good fit. All right, I'm done. Is there any questions? Yeah, generally I don't like to see people graze sorghum until it's at least 18 inches tall, just, just for safety in terms of prussic acid. You know, the one thing I'll say about prussic acid is it can be a problem. It's mostly a problem after your first freeze. So generally speaking, when, when you start to get your first freeze in the fall, you want to get animals off of sorghum pastures and off the pastures that have Johnson grass in it, right? Um, but, but prussic acid has probably scared more people away from using improved forage species like these, these BMR forage sorghums than and done worse to people that way than it has actually killed animals. And so it's important to, to manage, like, like Dean was saying, we need to manage those problems, but, but we can't get scared away from using good forage species.